Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Intermediate Algebra. We're going to look at section 6.1, which introduces roots and radicals. Those words are interchangeable. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is a question. And that question is, what number squared gives us 49? Now, algebraically, that's what this statement says. What number squared would give us 49? What we have to realize is that there's two possibilities. I know that 49 is a perfect square. It's 7 times 7. So 7 squared would give me 49. That's one possibility. The other possibility is negative 7. Negative 7 squared would also give me 49. Because a negative times a negative is a positive, And we're taking a number times itself. So negative 7 times negative 7 is also 49. So there's two solutions to this, plus or minus 7. And we'll discuss about when we introduce a radical, a square root, we have to remember a plus or minus for this particular reason. But what if we asked, what is uh, the square root of negative 49? Well, in the real number system, there is no real solution. So we'd actually say no real solution. Because there is no value times itself that would give us a negative. A negative times a negative is a positive. So we can't have a negative value if we're squaring a number. So hopefully that makes sense to you. What if we were? asked what number cubed gives us 8. Well, 2 cubed gives us 8. Now, when it comes to cubed roots, if I introduced a cubed root here, the value is positive. It gives me a positive. But what if I had negative 2 cubed? Well, that would give me a negative 8, because a negative times a negative times a negative is a negative value. We'd have an odd number of negatives. So if I said the cubed root of what number gives me a positive 8, I know that this value is positive, because there would be an odd number of negatives or an odd number of positives. Either way, this sign determines what I'm looking for. So if I had uh, the cubed root of x equals negative 8, I know that this value is a negative, because a negative times a negative times a negative is a negative value. One thing that's going to help us when we uh, work with roots and radicals is to know our perfect squares. And I've listed the perfect squares up to 13. This would be 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, so on and so forth, up through 13 squared, which is 169. Sometimes we might see fractions that are perfect squares. And their numerators and denominators will be a combination of those perfect squares. And if we can identify those, it's going to save us a lot of time when we look at a radical. Sometimes we'll see radicals of numbers that are not perfect squares. As an example, the square root of 2. This is an irrational number, which means it's a non-terminating decimal. So I wrote out uh, some of the values here, 1.414.2135. And that number would actually continue. But our calculators, if we put this into a calculator, can only read to so many digits. Eventually, it has to be rounded off. So this really isn't an equal sign. It's an approximation because it is irrational. It continues on. We should also know our perfect cubes. Um, <clears throat> obviously, not all of them. That would be too much to memorize. But we should know some of them. 1 cubed is 1, 2 cubed is 8, 3 cubed is 27, 4 cubed is 64, uh, 5 cubed is 125, so on and so forth. If we can recognize those, it's going to save us a lot of time. And some of our perfect fourth power numbers, such as 1, 16, 81, 256, 625, and so on. So you should know some of them, uh, and it'll save you some time. And if you recognize them, you'll be able to uh, come to the uh, solution a little bit faster. So let's look at some examples. <clears throat> here I have the square root. And notice that there's no number here. When there is no number here, we have to assume that it is a square root of index of 2. And we'll define index shortly. But this is a square root. What number times itself? When we don't see that value, we assume 2, because that is the lowest radical we can have. 
So what number times itself is 121? Well, I recognize 121 to be a perfect square of 11. 11 times 11 is 21. So the square root of 121 is 11. Here we have a cubed root, the cubed root of negative 125. Well, I identify cubed root of a negative. That's OK. I can have the cubed root of a negative because a negative times a negative times a negative is a negative value. I also identify 125 to be 5 cubed. It is a perfect cube. So I would get negative 5. And I can check that by saying, well, negative 5 times negative 5 would be a positive 25 times one more factor of negative 5 would give me that negative 125. Now here, I see a fraction under the radical. But I identify 16 is a perfect square. 25 is a perfect square. There's a negative. But it's OK, because even though it's a square root, this negative is on the outside. So it's saying a negative times this value. So if I'm going to assess this, well, a negative times the value is going to be a negative because there's only one negative, an odd number. The square root of 16 is 4, and the square root of 25 is 5, negative 4 25ths. So if I just look at 4 25ths, if I want to check my answer, I can square that. 4 times 4 is 16. 5 times 5 is 25, or essentially 4 fifths times 4 fifths would give me 16 25ths times a negative, a negative. 4 fifths. Here we have a cubed root. And I notice that they're both positive. So I know I'm dealing with a positive value because this is odd. So I can do the same thing I did here is I look at this and say, what number cubed is 8? Well, that would be 2. And what number cubed is 27? That would be 3. And I could check my work by or raising this to the third power, this power right here. 2 thirds times 2 thirds would be 6 ninths. 6 ninths times 2 thirds would, or excuse me, 4 thirds would be uh, 8 27ths. All right, so let's define this a little bit more. Here we have the nth root of a equals b. What we're going to do here is we're going to define some of the terminology. This value here is called the index. The index says, how many times would this would some number have to be multiplied to give me this value, which we call the radicand. We have the index and the radicand. And uh, this is something called the base, but we'll uh, define that later. And hopefully, we recall our rules of exponents. This is the base. This is the power. And this would be the argument. But you know that was uh, rules of exponents. So what, essentially, what this says is to what power do I raise a number, n, the nth power of a number, to get this value. Well, this value to this power gives me this value. So they're undoing each other. One operation undoes the other. So let's uh, discuss a little bit more detail of an even index. We saw a square root so far. And we're going to see fourth roots, sixth roots, and even higher powers. We're going to look at the even indexes. Well, what does that mean? If I have an even index, it means what's under this radical has to be a positive value. I can't take the even root of a negative. When I have an odd index, if n is an odd number, it can be positive or negative. It doesn't matter. My result will be either positive or negative, determining what this sign was. So we want to watch these even indexes and odd indexes because we cannot have negatives under our radical. Our radicands cannot be negative. So we're going to watch that. So let's look at this example here. Here we have the fourth root of 16. So my index is 4, and my radicand is 16. One way to find these solutions, maybe we don't recognize 16 to be a perfect fourth power number, even though it is, we can uh, factor these down. Well, I can say uh, 16 is 2 times 8, and 8 is 2 times 4, and 4 is 2 times 2. I have four factors of 2. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16, and that's a perfect fourth power number. So what I'm going to do is just rewrite it in a factored form, 2 to the fourth power. 
So the, what number to the fourth power is what this asks? I can say 2 to the fourth power. So 2 is the solution here. What power, or excuse me, what value raised to the fourth power would give me 16? 2 raised to the fourth power would give me 16. Here we have an odd index. I recognize 5 to be odd. And I see this as a negative value. So I know that my solution's negative because an odd number of negatives is a negative value. So we can factor this down as well in the same way. But for time's sakes, we'll just recognize this as a perfect fifth power number. This is 2 to the fifth. If 16 was 2 to the fourth, well, 16 times 2 is 32. One more factor of 2. So the fifth root of negative 32 is negative 2. And we can check that by raising this to the fifth power. Well, an odd number of negatives would be a negative value. 2 to the fifth is 32. So if we look at some more examples, here we have the square root of 4 squared. Well, one thing we can do, just kind of like I did here, I can see 4 and 4. It gave me that value. I can almost think of it as these 4s are canceling. And we'll get into that in the next section a little bit more when we look at rational exponents. So what I have here, if I have the square root of 4 squared, this says what number squared would give me 4 squared. Well, the 4 is what is being squared. So the answer is 4, because this is squared. Well, what if I had a negative uh, 4, that entire quantity being squared? And I'm asking, what's the square root of negative 4 squared? Well, we can have a negative here, even though it's under the radical. The reason why that is is because its quantity is in parentheses. I can almost think of these as canceling. The index is 2. This power is 2. They cancel out or reduce to 1. Negative 4 to the first power would just be negative 4. So here's a case where we can have a negative, but it's only because that quantity is the same as the index. That power of the radicand is the same as the index. Same thing with. Uh, odd roots. If I have the cubed root of 2 cubed, it's asking me what value cubed is 2 cubed. Well, the 2 is what is being cubed. So I can think of these as reducing to 1, 2 to the first power. Same thing here. If this is negative and it's being raised to the third power and I'm asking what's the cubed root of that value, we can think of this as reducing to 1. And it gives me negative 2. So we can have positives or negatives, positives or negatives. But with the even index, only when these match up. Okay, 2 is my index, and 2 is the power. So it reduces to a power of 1. So essentially what this is saying is if we have the nth root of something to the nth power, it gives me that base, that value. So we can simplify the radicand. So let's look at this. If I have the square root of a squared, well, that's just a. a could be a positive or a negative value because this reduces to 1. Here we have the cubed root of a cubed. Well, that would just be a. What power uh, or what value to the third power is the a value, right? Because we're asking to what power is a to the third power. Well, a is the value. All right, so let's look at a few other cases. What if we have multiplication or division uh, when we're dealing with radicands? Well, here I have the square root of 4 times the square root of 5. Now, I can do it one of two ways, and that's to simplify each one individually. And let's do that first. Well, the square root of 4 is 2 times the square root of 25 is 5, and 2 times 5 is 10. Well, one rule I can do, and it's going to be very useful, especially when I'm dealing with variables, is if they have the same index, in this case, they both have an index of 2. They are both square roots. I can rewrite this as the square root of 4 times 25. If their indexes are the, sta are the same, I can combine them under one radical. So if we look at this, well, 4 times 25 would be 100. And I recognize 100 to be a perfect square. The square root of 100 is 10. So either way we do it, we come to the same conclusion, the same solution. Well, when we have radicals, we can do the same thing. We can think of this 
I identify 4 as a perfect square and 25 as a perfect square. I could do this division and get a decimal, but we don't want a decimal. What we want to do is simplify it in terms of this. If I can bring them under the radical, I can also split them up because multiplication and division are similar operations. I can say, well, this is the square root of 4, and this is the square root of 25. I can treat the numerator separately from the denominator, but the whole thing is still under the radical. And if I do that, the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of 25 is 5. So the square root of 4 25ths is 2 fifths. And I did check my work by multiplying this 2 fifths times 2 fifths squared, right, the index, would give me 4 25ths. So what are we uh, actually defining here? Well, this, the first one we looked at was the product rule. If the indexes are the same, n and n in this case, I can bring them under the same radical, the nth root of their product. And then I could simplify it from there. The quotient rule says that if I have a fraction under a radical, I can split it up numerator and denominator. So instead of bringing it together, usually we want to break these apart because they're opposite operations. So let's define what it means to be a simplified radical. Well, a radical is simplified when there are no negative or zero exponents. If I have an exponent that is negative, I'd have to simplify it and maybe use that quotient rule um, because I don't want any negative exponents. If I simplify under the radical and end up with a 0 exponent, well, we should know anything to the 0 power is 1. So I don't want to leave this as 0. a to the 0, as an example, would be the square root of 1. a to the 0 power is 1. And the square root of 1 is something we can work with and simplify. 1 is a perfect square. So I could simplify it to 1. Another uh, case that we need to be aware of to simplify a radical is there can be no factors raised to a power greater than or equal to the index. If we look at this example, my index is 3, my power is 4. This power cannot be greater than that. To simplify that, and we'll look at some examples, is I can say, well, this is x times x times x times x. I can pull out three factors of x because x cubed times x. I'm, well, let me actually show that. What I'm essentially doing here is undoing that product rule we just saw. Instead of bringing them together under the index, I'm pulling them apart into two separate indexes. This I can simplify because these are the same, right? What value raised to the third pe uh, power is x to the third power? Well, this is x. So I can simplify this to just x. x times that value, now this is simplified because this power is not greater than the index. So x times the cube root of x would be this simplified. The index is as small as possible. What does that mean when we're simplifying these? Well, we can think of this as a fraction, and that's something we're going to introduce in the next section. But 2 and 4 have a common factor. We can take out that common factor and reduce it. Well, if I take out a 2 from each of these, it would become the square root of just x. Because 4 divided by 2 is 2. That would be a square root. And 2 divided by 2 is 1, x to the first power. So this has to be as small as possible. If there's a common factor, we can reduce it down to a more simplified radical, a smaller index. And then the last thing that we have to be aware of when simplifying radicals is that the denominator contains no radicals or no fractions appear under a radical. In this example here, we have 1 over the square root of 2. I cannot have a radical in a denominator, or I can't leave a fraction under a radical. I'd have to simplify that using the quotient rule. And then we'd have to rationalize a denominator. And that's something we'll look at in future sections. Let's look at simplifying some radicals. The first one I have here is the square root of 27. A powerful tool that we can use when dealing with these is to either know our perfect squares, cubes, or higher power numbers, or to use the tool of factoring. Now, 
I recognize 27 as a perfect cube, but I'm asked to find a square root. I identify that the index is 2. So I could say, well, I know that this is 3 to the third power. So the square root of 3 to the third power. And one thing I can do is say, well, how many factors of 3 can I actually pull out of this to simplify it? Well, I can think of this as, well, 3 times 3 is a perfect square. And then I'd have another factor of 3. So I could pull out a 3 because 3 is being multiplied by itself. But there's always that additional factor of 3 because this is cubed and that's only a index of 2. Well, the other way to look at it here is think of it as doing division. And recall division in, when we first learned it. We used things called remainders. Well, if the index is 2, I can ask myself, how many times does 2 go into 3? It goes into 3 once with a remainder of 1. Well, if I apply that to factors, if it goes into this uh, power one time, that means I can remove one factor of 3. With a remainder of 1, one factor has to remain under the radical. So hopefully, you, know, you can use these tools, whether you factor this down to 9 times 3 and say, hey, 9 is a perfect square. The square root of 9 is 3. But the square root of 3 is an irrational number, so I'm going to leave it as a radical. Notice either way we do it, we're going to get the same example. I prefer the factoring method sometimes. We can break it down and say, here's my perfect square. I've identified that. I can take the square root of this piece. It's kind of undoing the product rule that we discussed earlier in this video. All right, let's look at this one here. Maybe you recognize 16 to be uh, 2 to the fourth power. And then you could say, well, 3 goes into 4 one time, so I can pull out one factor of 2. Or maybe you just want to factor it down. So let's do that. 16 is 8 times 2. If you can recognize 8 as a perfect cube, you're ready to simplify this. The cube root of 8 is 2. And the cube root of 2, well, I can't simplify that any further. We've simplified this radical. So the cube root of 16 is 2 cubed root of 2. And some students might ask, well, why are we doing this? Why, are we, why can't we just leave it as the cube root of 16? Well, when we're dealing with radicals, radicals are a concept that sometimes leaves us with irrational numbers such as this. So we want to maybe estimate at some point in the future so I know that this is 2 times something a little bit more than 1. So maybe for estimating purposes, it has its usefulness. Um, but we want to make this radical as small as possible to minimize the radical so that it doesn't have such a great impact on the mathematical operations we may have to do with this. All right, here we have the square root of 18. And notice it's not a perfect square. It's not a perfect cube. It's not a perfect uh, any specific integer number. So maybe this is a perfect candidate to factor down. I'm going to leave this one for you. Maybe you can factor that and then identify its factors to have any perfect squares uh, to take the square root of. So try this one yourself. Let's look at another example. Here we have the cube root of 40, y to the 10th. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, apply a couple of concepts here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to factor down 40. I know that 40 is, uh, well, let's say 4 times 10. 4 times 10. And I can factor these values down a little bit further. 4 is 2 times 2, and 10 is 2 times 5. What I've identified here is that there are three factors of 2. I could have factored this another way. I could have said, well, 40 is 8 times 5. 8 is a perfect cube. So that's what I'm looking for. So I factored that. So now I can say, well, the cube root of 2 cubed, I can think of it as those uh, powers would reduce to 1, would give me 2. Well, let me write this over here. So I've dealt with the number. Now I can move on to the variable. Well, I can use that uh, tool of division with remainders. How many factors of y cubed do I have here? Because I want to find perfect cubes. So I can say, well, 3 goes into 10 three times. 
which means I can pull out three factors of y. Well, how many would remain? Well, 3 goes into 10 three times with a remainder of 1. One factor of y remains. Now, this 5, I wasn't able to take the cube root of that. So that would also still remain under the radical. So if we think about this, and I'll clean it up right here, 2y cubed times the cubed root of 5y. This is simplified form of that radical, 2y cubed times the cubed root of 5y. So we've minim minimized the index, uh, or excuse me, the radicand that's under that index of 3. So we can factor and we can use division. And when we get into the next section, we'll understand that division a little bit more in depthly. Let's look at another example. Here I have the square root, an index of 2, of the radicand of 12r to the 9th, s to the 12th. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with the number first. I'm going to say, well, 12 is 4 times 3. I recognize 4 to be a perfect square. So the square root of 4 is 2. So I was able to pull that value out. I dealt with that number. The 3 is a factor that remains. So I'm going to write it over here. That 3 would still remain under that radical. Here we have r to the 9th. Well, my index is 2. I'm going to use division. 2 goes into 9. How many times? Four times. With a remainder of 1, one of the r's has to remain. How many times does 2 go into 12? Well, 2 goes into 12 six times. So I can pull out 6 of those factors of s. And if we think about it, s to the 6 times itself, s to the 6, would give me s to the 12th. Knowing your rules of exponents are going to be extremely helpful when it comes to simplifying radicals. So, there's nothing left to simplify there because no s's would remain. So no s's remain under there. There would be no remainder in that division. So we have 2r to the fourth s to the sixth times the square root of 3r. So we've minimized that radicand. We've simplified that radical. All right, let's look at this one here. Here we have a radical divided by a radical, and they have the same index. Here's where I can apply that quotient rule. It's 7 times this value. Well, the quotient rule says that if I have a fraction under a radical, I can split it up into uh, two separate numbers that I can simplify, the numerator and the denominator. Well, I can also do that the opposite direction. If I have the same index, I can write this as a fraction under the same radical. That is the quotient rule. And now I can simplify that. I know 162 is divisible by 2. And if I do that, 162 divided by 2 is 81. And hopefully, we recognize 81 to be a perfect fourth power number. It is 3. So I have 7 times this quantity, which would be 7 times 3. And I'm skipping some steps for a reason here, which would give me 21. So maybe it's kind of hard to see that. Maybe you don't recognize this as a perfect fourth power number, so you can use the tool of factoring. I know that 81 is 9 times 9. Maybe you identified it as a perfect square. But 9 is also a perfect square of 3 times 3. And this 9 is 3 times 3. I have four factors of 3. So if I think about this as 3 to the fourth, well, what power is being raised, or what value is being raised to the fourth power? 3. So 3 times 7 is still 21. Either way you look at it, you should come to the same conclusion. But you have to know your rules of exponents and be able to identify maybe your perfect squares, perfect cubes, perfect fourth power numbers. All right, let's look at this one here. We have the cubed root of 54x to the fifth. So if I'm to simplify this, I can say, all right, well, 54, maybe I don't see any larger factors. Maybe I only see, well, it's an even number. So I'm going to divide it by 2. And 2 and 54 would be 27. Maybe I recognize 27 to be a perfect cube well, of 3. 3 times 3 times 3 would be 27. Maybe I don't recognize that. So I'm going to factor it even further. Well, I know 27 is 3 times 9, and 9 is 3 times 3. So at any point, if you can identify that perfect 
uh, power number, maybe you could stop there. Or you can continue it down and do its prime factorization. Say, well, I have three factors of 3. I can take a 3 out of that radical. That 2 is the only factor that would remain, so I can't pull that 2 out. It stays under the radical. Here we have x to the fifth, so I can use division with remainders. 3 goes into 5 once, so I can take out one factor. With a remainder of 2, two factors have to remain. This is the simplified radical. I was able to pull out a factor of 3 because there were three of them with a remainder of the 2 under the radical. And then I did the division of the powers. 3 goes into 5 one time, so I was able to pull 1x out. With a remainder of 2, two factors of x remain under the radical. So that's simplified. This example here, I want you to try this one for yourself. It's similar to this one. Maybe you want to factor it down. Maybe you recognize this as a perfect power number. And uh, take it from there. Simplify the radicals. Now, you might have to, uh, no, I think that'll be it. You leave it just like that. Simplify it down and uh, keep trying. Do the homework. Practice is going to help you identify those values and the easiest way that's going to work for you to simplify them. This has been section 6.1. Thank you for watching.